and welcome to another broadcast. Thanks for joining us. Today we have a special edition. Uh, it's me and Tony, and we're going to include AC Middleton in here. So AC, thanks for, for joining us. Yeah, happy one. to be here for this discussion, definitely. We might have to broaden, if this works good, we may have to broaden it up uh, permanently. <laughs> or maybe even rotate it through different staff in here. Yeah. It would be pretty cool. I think that's a good idea. You just don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> But today, it's too burdensome. <laughs> today, we've got answers. <laughs> we've got answers by Charlemagne the God and James Altucher. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, so Charlemagne the God, if you guys don't know, his uh, real name is Leonard uh, McKelvey. He's a radio host, um, I guess most famously known for The Breakfast Club. Uh, got uh, inducted to the Radio Hall of Fame in 2020. And he is the self-proclaimed Prime Minister of Pissing People Off and the architect of aggression. But he's entertaining, right, you know? And sometimes uh, you gotta not be afraid to say things to get people to talk about them at all, even if, if some people are uncomfortable about it. Uh, and then James, he's an author, podcaster, serial entrepreneur, hedge fund manager, uh, someone that uh, feels strongly about things and, and wanted to be a part of pushing the needle forward. And I think um, asked Charlemagne to do this and he didn't want to, but then ended up changing his mind. Um, and of course, um, let's just, this is a unique book. Let's talk about the format a little bit. Why don't you explain it a little bit, AC? Yeah, so um, for the most part, Charlemagne really just kind of acts as, you know, the person who kind of um, sets up the segue from interview to interview, you know, and then uh, James does the majority of the questioning and they have, they bring on different people to talk about particular uh, items relevant to their work and whatnot. So there's not very much of an alignment going from interviewee to interviewee no. as far as subject matter. Right. Um, so I mean, it, it's pretty it's pretty cool in the way that you can kind of listen to it episodically. Right. So you don't have to listen to it all the way through to be able to get this grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just kind of want to hear what one person's opinion is on things, then you can do that. If For sure. You, if you want to listen to it the whole way through, you're getting. You're jumping all across the board, so don't expect a lot of continuity with things outside and, of just being the black experience. I know you were, uh, when I asked you to do this, you were kind of uh, hesitant to want to do it because I think you just know a lot more than me and Tony, and you already knew that you didn't necessarily agree with everyone there. And I'm like, that's okay. That's part of what book reviews are about. And you're like, oh, okay, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think part of it also is, you know, um, I was talking to Tony about this. Um, it's really valuable that we have people in the media who are willing to kind of push these, these conversations forward. Um, one of the cautions that I always have is, uh, is it coming really from a reputable source, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of scholarship in black history and uh, black economic movements and whatnot. And to see a, a radio personality as kind of the means through which this has to be kind of moved forward I think it's it, it, it can be good or bad. It's the pop culture. He was like the the publicity of this, right? And right. the and the interviewees were kind of the substance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, yeah, it's just you, you get mixed reviews because it's like, okay, you got Michael Eric Dyson, you got Cornell West, you have Melissa Harris Perry, you have a lot of people who write on this, and it's their job to write on this. Right. And then you have Charlemagne the God who, as as large of a following that he has, it's not his job right. to come to an understanding like of the ins and outs of, you know, the black experience economically, you know, socially and all the things that go with it. So yeah, that's that's why you kinda take it with a grain of salt sometimes. But I think it's great that he brought on people to talk about it because I came into it thinking it was just him talking about everything. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Well and this is it's, it's a book, but it's really an interview, and it just kind of goes off on tangents and things like that. I mean, we can, I know we, you know, it's not like a typical book where you've got somebody who did some research and, and went through some things, but what you have basically is... But I mean, yeah, who knows what happened? You yeah. know, did he look, look up the questions first and then kick them out to them to see if it was okay? Right. You know, right. or did he really just pop the questions on them? Right. I, I Even after reading it, I still can't tell what happened there but I don't know some of the people are famous so they may not have agreed to come on there if they didn't know what yeah what was going to be asked ahead of time there's also like pop culture people who want to be on something like this so you know yeah. it, it, it seemed like every person because it was a real dialogue 
Um, I don't think from just listening to this that any of those people could have been pushed around. Fair I think enough. They were going to hold their own. Fair enough. Even yeah. if they got asked some divisive question that they didn't want to answer. Yeah. Right. I, I did think I liked the fact that the openness of the answers you could tell. I mean, some of them had they were angry about things, but I think they talked openly and freely about things, you know. And it, it does make you wonder like, did they come back and say, you know what, I, I wouldn't mind if we cut that out? Or, or <laughs> the part where they got really mad. <laughs> yeah, but it didn't feel that way. It felt like they were genuine, and you know. Um, James was genuine in, in his questions and follow-up questions, sure. too. Yeah. So what we're going to do kind of format-wise, this one may end up being a little bit longer, but we're going to go down through each person that was in there. I mean, really, you know, no offense to anyone for, you know, you're obviously all in this book, uh, very important, knowledgeable, et cetera. So if it's a shorter part of it, uh, it's just because we just didn't have much to talk about right now on that subject, and we have to kind of move through this because we try to keep it to, like, 30 minutes, but I don't think we're going to succeed here. So first up, we had Nita Turner from Cleveland, Ohio, was a, a state senator for us from 08 to 2014, and is now running for Marsha Fudge's uh, seat in the in the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives. Um, I, I'll give just in each one of these a couple takeaways that I just had, and maybe kick off the discussion, and people can add in. I, I, I thought. Um, I thought it was really cool when I heard her talk about that she really liked Black Panther and she wished her 15-year-old self, you know, could have had something like that back then. Um, and, and another thing that, that st stood out to me was uh, just the, the example that she gave of the, the younger uh, doctor students, you know, think like the majority of them thinking that black people had thicker skin and not as sensitive of nerves, and it's like... They're like studying for a PhD, right? right. You know? Right. Did you guys have any takeaways or anything from that one? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, for those who don't know, I studied African American studies in undergrad. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which is probably a good part of our audience, as you know, right? Really? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I, when I hear her talk about these things, you know, not a lot of people are aware that there was like a, a plethora of pseudoscience that came out of like, the 1800s, that really came out of the Enlightenment, to be honest, mm -hmm. that, that informed a lot of what Western ideas were with Africans in particular. So phrenology, where people would kind of like grade people's intelligence based on skull sizes and, right. and you know, um, eugenics as a whole, you know, it really came out of this sort of uh, racial superiority complex right. that was built up in the youth science to kind of uh, supplant the the arguments for things like bastardizing Darwinism, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, so I wasn't surprised to hear about that, but I think it speaks to the unconscious biases that people have. That because honestly, you don't know that some of this was pseudoscience. You don't know how much of what you're getting is propaganda, right? And, and until you're put in that situation, it's like, oh, that's a lie. I would have never thought it. Yeah. You know, but we're we're always taking in this sort of stuff. I think the thing that, that stuck out to me with her was the last question that uh, James asked her when uh, she asked, you know, how much would you give uh, for your child to not be black? Yeah. You know, and that, that one was like, you know, that speaks, I think, to a larger trauma that people in the African-American community have um, with just their experience overall. Um, but... Even in there, there was resolve in her answer. It's like, it's not that I don't want to be black. It's that I don't want my child to deal with the burdens that come. The burdens, yeah. You know? Yeah. So I thought that was that, that was an awesome interview. It was a great way to start. Right, right. Off. Yeah. I thought she did a really good job as well, too. She was one of the more, and again, I think she's a good politician, more of a bring people together type person. Yeah. You know, I think the most controversial thing she said, which I don't think is necessarily that controversial, was... Um, that she does believe that institutional racism exists. And to me, if, if that's her most, like, strong statement right, right there. That's the most controversial. It's right. not that controversial. <laughs> right, right. Because obviously, uh, we have the statistics and everything, and it does, right? Yeah. You know, so. All right, so moving on, uh, we had uh, Teslin Figaro. She's a political consultant for many years. Um, and uh, she's actually on the po podcast with Charlemagne the God, I think, has, has, a, has a part on there. Um, 
I had four kind of snippets that I'll kind of throw out there. You know, she said, you know, people being more concerned about property instead of people when they start talking about violence and protests mm -hmm. because, like, nobody's killing each other or anything like that. Um, people need to do more, uh, need to do more uh, than protest. I think one of her quotes was, I'd rather have soldiers than allies, which obviously, you know, now we're getting a little bit more contested. But what I, you know, when she was talking about soldiers, more about like doing things and being involved, yeah. not like fighting. Sense, but again, yeah. that's, it is dangerous to say something like that because people can take you out of context. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, one of the things that I think took uh, James off, but she's like, this is just the beginning if things don't change. She's like, what do you mean by that? You know, like, yeah. like revolution type thing. So like, obviously she's fired up, but I think I listened to it twice. And the second time, it didn't catch me as much as the first time. So I think I, you needed to like, listen to her yeah. a little bit more. You guys have additives to that one? No, uh, would you, um, I, I would say too, the soldier was more, I always take that as figuratively. I mean, it's, it's somebody who's doing something as opposed to sponsoring it. That's I guess right. I was in the military, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, soldier me, soldier. Uh, and, I, and I get that, I, and I get that some people are gonna take it literally, but I, that's how I, you know, when I hear that. Yeah. And then I also like Master P back in the day. He was just talking about soldiers. <laughs> he was literal, too. <laughs> well, I mean, on No Limit, it was a tank. There you no, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, no, I, I think what she, what she mentioned is actually, like, pretty, like, is a pretty important, like, sticking point when she talks about the, the priority that property and personal rights mm -hmm. have when it comes to, like, uh, protest and things like that, because... You know, people are way more concerned about property damage, and they use that as a justification for people not voicing, you know, whatever displeasure that they may have with certain systems. Um, and we prioritize, you know, the need to not damage somebody's property. When, I mean, revolutions were built off of property damage. What was the Boston Tea Party? Right. <laughs> you know? Well, people don't want property damage when the other side is protesting. Well, I think a couple people made the point, too, that a lot of the people doing a lot of the looting and property damage were opportunists and not necessarily yeah. part of the main part of the True, but all part of the, the protest either. And so then it just becomes an excuse to try to condemn and shut it down. Exactly. That's know? all you need yeah. is that those one or two like instances where somebody can point at it. You know, there's a fine line that protests have to walk as far as being accepted by the counterculture. Because ultimately, getting some attention versus garnering the wrong attention. Yeah, right. you know. So right, right, right. So moving on, uh, we had Bishop William Barber. Um, he is a Protestant minister out of North Carolina. He's on the board of the NAACP. Um, you know, I really liked his interview. He's obviously a really sharp guy. Um, so I'll give my little short things here. I liked, you know, when he said, "I can't breathe." became shorthand for like collective frustration. And he gave a lot of examples, so obviously I'm not even giving it the, uh, like how well he said it. Um, he talked about um, like a, an old political conspiracy, uh, like back in the day of how politicians changed to basically like pit poor white people against black people so that they could control the country economically. Um, and it, it does, it's very conspiracy theory-ish. But I don't know that I'd necessarily disagree with him. And he told a good story about it. Um, and then he talked a lot about how a lot of the history learned is revisionist history. Okay. And what so, so. Yeah. Um, well, this, so history is really, like, important, right? Because it's how we construct our views of the world. Um, but one thing that's often not discussed about history is that history is always written by the winner. Sure, for sure. You know, um, so they said it a couple times, and I grew up learning this this uh, this statement. But until the history is in, until the tale of the hunt is told from the story of the lion, it will always glorify the hunter. Right. You know, and they said it like once or twice in there, but it's <coughs> it's the same idea. Like you don't hear the losing side. You know, but yeah. that's a very different story depending on where you stand on the fence. And I think when it comes to us understanding the truth about our history in general, you know, there's a certain point in time where it takes on this idea of mythology. Yeah. You know, without that, without that counterweight of what the other side of it is, we don't get the full picture. 
So I, I think yeah. it's really important that people hear, you know, um, dissenting views right. on different things, that people hear what the story was from the other side, because the more comprehensive of the tale you get, the more understanding of the nuances that you get. Because me and you have had this conversation before too. It's like good and bad is really is relative. really difficult to nail yeah. on. It's like it's, it's relative. Things are nuanced. Things are complicated. And I think all too often we're afforded the luxury of oversimplifying things because we were the winners. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think there's two points that I like got from a lot of the like I like I thought about in this, um, and I think number one is that. Um, yeah, things are not perfect, um, and they're not great. But then when I was thinking about it, and there's, like, all this criticism and everything, it's still, like, there's never been a perfect, awesome government or civilization, right. even though we might glorify things in the past. And the United States has gobs of problems and things that we need to make better and right, yeah. et cetera. But it's still a pretty good country. You know, I don't think people want to leave and go somewhere else generally, yeah. you know. Um, and so, and, and then th- th- that going along with that is I think it is more awesome now almost ever in history that even though it's still not great, it's not being taught generally unless you like major right. in it or something like this, but it's available and the information's out there. In the past, they have burned the books. They would change it. Anybody that tried to teach it, they would execute them. Right, right. You know? Right. And so, from that perspective, I think it's pretty cool that we're progressing, like, as a species. Yeah. You know? Uh, but it's still, you know, far from utopian. Yeah. You know? I mean, by far, the American experience is the greatest democratic, like, experiment that has ever been tested. But the thing is, like, it's being tested and it's consistently being tested. Sure. You know, um, our history is riddled with movements forward and then two, three steps backwards. Right. You know, that that's always been the thing, you know, um, from the founding of our uh, of the 13 colonies, right? Trying to decide whether or not the, the Articles of Confederacy were a thing versus adopting a strong centralized government. You know, there was blowback over that. You know, Reconstruction is something that's not openly talked about. No, it's yeah, kind of like... Sure. After the Civil War, we move right into civil rights as if those whole, you know, those it's decades gone. don't exist. That's because nobody wants to talk about it. Right. You know, it's 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 a horrible, horrible history, and it's a blight on the American experience. In all honesty, but I think it's more valuable that we start to have those discussions because that's that's what informed the civil rights movement. There wouldn't be that outrage if it weren't for those decades. Yeah. You know that established Jim Crow and everything. Else. It's, it's amazing to me that those few people, after being thoroughly defeated, were able to maintain control yeah. in the end. Yeah. You know? um, so. Yeah. Right. So well, just one thing. You know, it's like uh, they call it the lost cause. You know, when people were talking about um, the idea about uh, how the South came to stand for states' rights now. Right. Um, or when it just changed all, the narrative versus yeah. what it really was. Or when all yeah. these civil rights, when all these like civil war monuments were after, actually put up, they weren't put up directly after the civil war. They were put up in like the nineteen thirties. They 40s. had to wait a while. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it, this. That's a whole counter movement that took place. That's largely been able to inform the way that people see the Gatson flag, the way that people start to see the Confederate flag, um, and all its accompaniments. So yeah, lost cause. It's 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 really interesting to kind of learn that sort of stuff. We may have to do another another book on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so the next we had Ebony Williams. Um, people probably know her pretty well from CBS, Fox News. She's an attorney in North Car- North Carolina, prosecutor and civil cases. Um, I think she talked about police evolved from policing slaves. Um, I wasn't even fully aware of that, and I'm I liked ancient history and I did military history, but I try to think back and I you know I think about like Roman stuff and whatever, and there really weren't police, you know the military was there, yeah. you know, um, but it is interesting uh, that we kind of evolved that, and the rest of the world has followed suit a little bit, right. but they're not near as harsh or militarized as our police, um, uh, and then. The, I, the quote from there that I just have never really thought about is like the police 
aren't here to serve and protect. They're here to enforce the law. And that's absolutely true. You know? Um, yeah. But I feel like, I think everybody thinks that. You know? Yeah. I think Q's the same person who mentioned how uh, Protect and Serve was a, was a propaganda campaign. From running. A marketing, a marketing campaign. Yeah, it was, like, it was always plastered on the cards. And I look back and it did date back to like 1955. So it has been around, but it didn't really become part of the narrative is what we talk about police. Everybody until, thinks police are that. Exactly, right until that. Rodney King is Rodney really King, when. Because the police were so damaged by that, you know, in the age of television that they had to figure out a way to reinstitute some sort of confidence in police. So protect and serve and, you know, shows like Cops, you know, came about to kind of reinstitute our belief in that in that factor of society. So I, I, so that came along in the 50s, I'd say? Yeah, when they came around, yeah. I'd say the Cops is a show. I learned nothing about policing. <laughs> I just was always watching it saying, please tase somebody. Tase them. <laughs> 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 That's bad to admit, but that was like the entertainment because when I used before we had like the recording of shows, yeah. was, that used to be my like last channel. <laughs> like I would like I would watch cops so much when there's a commercial on from the main show. Yeah. <laughs> I, was well, I mean, let's be honest, we all kind of watch cops to see like the car chases and everything else. Like we live vicariously through that, you know. All right. Um, and then next we had uh, Corey Miner Smith. She is an attorney in Canton, Ohio, so another Ohio uh, interviewee on here. Um, her, a lot of what she focused on was mental illness and her mother having a severe mental illness. Um, and that African Americans don't trust the healthcare system and there's a lot of reasons why. Um, and then she brought up microaggressions, which is one of the kind of the key things I wrote down here and like from my conclusion that I learned because I had never heard of microaggressions. You know, yeah. I'll let you guys take it from there. Yeah, I mean, Corey Miner Smith, um, a lot of great stuff that she talked about. You know, I think the big thing that she talked about, especially with mental health awareness, again, going back to the doctors, is like how do they determine, you know, uh, mental illnesses or, or, or mental um, episodes you know, in individuals, and it's like African Americans tend to be seen one way; they're more highly diagnosed with schizophrenia. Right. You right, know, right. I remember her saying that. It's prescribed as more of a as more of an ailment than an episode, right? Mm -hmm. Just an outburst. No, it's a, it's something indicative about a larger problem for them. Whereas, right, and more of it should be classified as mood disorder and things. Exactly. You know. Exactly. So I, I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. because. Because I mean, a lot of schizophrenics get classified as violent and stuff as well, too. So then it would probably propagate a whole line of wrongness in terms of assumptions. Right, right. And it's well not too. like we haven't gotten it wrong before, right? You know, it's like women in hysteria. Women were sterilized, you know, because hysteria literally translates to ailment of the uterus. So mm -hmm. the way to deal with women um, when they were having these sort of ex episodes was to send them to a mental institution. So, you know, we have a tendency of being a little bit heavy-handed when it comes to other people when they're removed Remove enough. the problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's a major problem. And then you combine that when somebody is a different color of skin or a different group than you, there's more likely to have a bad outcome. Right, right, right. It's, you know, it's funny. It's like uh, going a little bit further about women. It's funny how, like, one of the most highly prescribed drugs for women in, like, the 40s and the 50s was Valium. Really? Yeah, because it's like housewife syndrome is what they used to call it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> wow. So next uh, we had Dr. Claude Anderson. And so I think uh, his claim to fame recently was when uh, Kanye was, you know, recommending Trump and Biden to both listen to him as kind of, uh, you know, black race history. Uh, that's where they should go. He runs something uh, called uh, Powernomics Corporation. Um, and then, uh, you know, my, kind of my three takeaways that I just kind of made bullet notes. It sounds like, I mean, even he was just scratching the tip of the iceberg of what, you know, he believes and talks about. But uh, racism is economic. And there's a whole, actually, very interesting discussion, I thought, on there behind that. Racism is not discrimination. And that, uh, that African-Americans should pool resources and keep money in the community. You guys want to add on or anything but, to that? I, I, absolutely, I don't think it's, if there's, I, I believe it's used as, 
as a tool for wealthy people to a degree, you know, in terms of economics. Um, as we talked about the splitting of, of poorly poor people, you know, to that degree, it's used economic to get them to vote against each other and against their interests, and instead of helping the general masses. And so to that degree, on that economic level, I see it. But I didn't understand the other line about it's discrimination is not racism. Racism, yeah. 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 So well, I think he just defines racism very differently than probably a lot of people would. And so, um, and so, <coughs> When you say discriminate, you can discriminate on anything. <coughs> not necessarily, got to be on race, and so um, obviously, discrimination can be a part of racism. I would imagine, unlike how he's trying to define it. Um, but I, I, mean, I thought it was a good conversation. I, I think a problem I have with a, a few of the people on here. I think that there are so many times in history, and I think conspiracy theorists are very, I wouldn't say guilty, but like they fall into this thinking of like there's like this cabal of super smart people that like develop like in my whole experience with humanity even really smart they can't get along they can't do crap together they can't make a five year plan come out much less like a 50 or a hundred year like how'd they get conspiracy that huh how'd they get that chip in you <laughs> <laughs> so to me it's just like I, I have no doubt that we have institutional racism and there's a lot of things to atone for. But I, I don't think there was like this secret room of like 20 people that engineered this and kept this up for 200 years. I just, I don't think it's possible. You know, I don't it's think human necessary. beings are like capable of it unless they had like alien help, like <laughs> like the Egyptians using aliens to build the pyramids, which obviously I don't think happened either. Right. But to me, it's just like, I just, I don't think humans are capable well, of that type of long-term organization, if that it, makes sense. Yeah. Well, it depends on how it's structured, right? So I would say, you know, first, you know, when he talks about discrimination is not racism. Like, as far as, like, on, on like, a sociological level, there's this idea that you have bias, like, prejudice, discrimination, and then racism, right? They all exist on a hierarchy, and everybody can be biased, Sure. Biases are the way that we kind of navigate the world. You have to be able to tell A from B, so there's nothing wrong about bias. You know, prejudice comes about when you start attaching some sort of moral to it. Mm -hmm. So good versus bad, A versus B, I like this because it's good. You know, uh, discrimination becomes when you have some sort of, like, adverse reaction to that as well. Racism deals with the idea of the power structure. Right. So now it's enforceable. So that's why, you know, a lot of people, and Claude Anderson, which I had a lot of problems with that whole section of, the, of the, honestly, honestly. I can but, tell you didn't want to engage with the, with the first part, the, but, when I first brought it up, yeah. Man, I, <laughs> we could go on for a couple minutes about him. But, um, no, I think when, when people make that statement, it's like black people can't be racist. What they're trying to say is that because black people as a, as a demographic in society don't have the same amount of power, it's difficult for them to exert something because the institutions don't back them. Whereas, like, because... Can't be, like, institutionally racist. Right, right. the power so, base is not there. Because the power base is not there. But because the power base is there, that's what allows racism to occur. But they could definitely be, like, anti-white biased yeah, and discriminatory. absolutely, discriminatory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's like the whole thing that race, at the end of the day, is a social construct. It doesn't exist... You know, as far as from a genome perspective, we're all way more similar than we are different. There's nothing yeah, significant sure. to say that, right? But we've been fed this idea that race is way more significant, right? Yeah. Purity of blood and whatnot on both sides. Black people want to only date black people. Asians only want to date Asians. White people only want to keep it in the family and keep it white. You know, it, <laughs> it is what it is at that point in time. But I do believe him, and that was kind of my whole reckoning with racism at the end of the day, is that I do believe is economically motivated. Because at the, end of the, I, at the end of the day, society at that point in time was in the process of nation building, mm -hmm. right? And the, a lot of the things that were pushing things were independent businesses, right? There, was, there were charters to come over to America outside, right. of, outside of the pilgrims. So because there is a business that needs to be founded, there needs to be labor. So there were people who came over as indentured servants and they paid off their labor to become citizens, right. right? And then they had to figure out a way to find 
the cheapest labor that they could. They tried to enslave the indigenous Americans, but they couldn't do it because they knew the land too long. Um, they knew the land too well. They could run away more easily. And the and they were disease resistant. Exactly. Yeah. The diseases that came over with the Europeans killed them off way too easily. Yeah. Um, Africans had had a longer history of interacting with Europeans. Right. So they were able to interact with them in a more sustainable fashion. And it, it makes it easier. But then once you get to the moral justification of enslaving another human, you have to justify it morally in your mind. Right, right. So you create yeah. all these other things on top of it I to agree. make you feel right about it. Yeah, and it was it was a economic just expedient thing to do, right? And they were allowed to do it exactly, and they did it. I mean, I I totally could see like how business is experimenting with things, and there might have been a lot of people that said, "I'm not going to do that," but then they probably ended up going out of business, right? From the superior business model, right? And then then they tried to basically what's it called? Um, where you uh, just justify in in past tense like yeah. we did this because right to yeah. validate and all that yeah and then validate yeah. yeah and then when you think about it again all the things that are kind of built into it this it, sooner or enough momentum inertia just takes its own it just takes its way with things mm -hmm. right you know once that ball got got rolling it was no surprise that larger tails get get spurred up about it because now you got to kind of continue to lie you got to continue to justify what all of this means um, so race became a monster in and of its own because we had to figure out a way to moralize it with ourselves. Yeah. So, so next up we had Tamika Mallory. She's a New York activist. She's an activist her whole life. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that uh, I took away from her was I liked this quote. It says, you know, when the system refuses to give justice to an injured party. Like you, you shouldn't stop, like protesting or, or what. So I, I thought that was a, a cool succinct way, to say it. Yeah. Any input from you guys, on her? I, I think that's the value of the, uh, of the Fourteenth Amendment. I think that's a, that's a lot of what, the democratic like experiment now really like spurs itself on, right? Is this idea of the injured party and. How do we hold them accountable as feeling included too? Right. You know, um, so social justice, women's rights, um, ableism, LGBTQ rights, immigrant rights, all of that kind of spurs about it as the injured party, you know, wanting to be seen on equal footing. Right. And then she did explain like defunding the police is not like abolishing it, even though I found it interesting that she said that she, she was, was a police yeah. abolitionist. <laughs> yeah, she did say that. But if she, she kind of clarified say, that yeah. to say that I hope one day we don't need police, not like I hate them and I want to get rid of them. Right. You know, so. Um, and then uh, Jamelia Davis, she was a real estate broker, investor. Uh, she used to help a lot of early um, affluent uh and uh, I guess wealthy or famous African Americans like Jay Z and Witzo figure out how to get houses and stuff like that, and then ended up going to jail for for twelve years for wire fraud and bank fraud and Witzo. And interestingly, she had a lot of people that were colluding with her, uh, for, especially Lehman Brothers, that uh, didn't get in trouble at all. Right. And right. so I don't feel as sorry for her as it still angers me that a lot of those people didn't go to jail. Like, our system is inherently ridiculous to rich, especially rich white people. Like, after 2008, 2009, yeah. tons of people should have gone to jail. Yeah. Eric Holder. <laughs> <laughs> but he has a perfect record, right? You know, so. You know, that that one was a weird one, because, I mean, I, I, I understand your stance, and I, I feel the same way, right? You know, what she did... Um, to get to jail, she went to jail for a reason. Like, right, she did. You, you, you violated sure. some laws. Right. Okay, that. But I also feel like she did take some sort of ownership for it. Sure. The only thing that she didn't do was she also made the mistake. I think, and oftentimes, is that it doesn't. It doesn't win you anything to point the finger the opposite way. It's like, but they did it too. Right. You know, like it didn't work in school, and it's not going to work now. <laughs> you, you know, right. if you're if you were in school and somebody smacked you, but you smacked I the guy. Just totally feels cheated yeah yeah because even though she broke the law and stuff she's like well you know i got a year for each million right. and 
if they just would have let me organize all the stuff I had organized, they wouldn't have lost any money. Right. And I'm just like, uh, slippery slope. But still, they should have gone to jail too. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, it's the, it's the inequities in the justice system. No, like I said. absolutely. I so, think that's the point. Right. Of so that, what was it? You know? Obama made it a big thing uh, to deal with the crack cocaine versus the powder uh, cocaine discrepancy in sentencing. Sure. Right. Because crack was more prevalent in urban areas where blacks and brown people were. And it was it was enforced in a much more harsher way yeah. than cocaine, which cocaine was known to be a you know a upper upper elite expensive sort of drug. drug. Yeah, it's yeah. An expensive yeah. drug. So the the it's the same it's the same drug. It comes from the same plant, right. you know. But it but it's enforced in two totally different ways. Sure. And I think a, a iteration of that now is marijuana. Yeah. You know, you think of how many people over the years have gone to jail. For marijuana, they mentioned that in here and how like white usage is just as high. Right, but not only usage. that, yeah. but now as we start to legalize marijuana and people are building industries on top of that, people should get out. Yeah, yeah, I got in trouble for that in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's it's interesting legally for sure. Well, and to the point, it's like we didn't do it enough, right? She she really was unaffected by what with your example, Lehman Brothers did. So right, she what happened to her could have been fair and just, but. It's not fair and just that you know a higher percent of black people right. are getting that kind of sentencing. Yeah. I mean, the drugs are the right on example. Yeah. You know, so. So our next one uh, is Brother Nuri Muhammad, um, and he is a minister in the Nation of Islam. Nation so we had a discussion about this before because I didn't even realize that Islam, Nation of Islam, are like two different things. Yes. Um, so a uh, couple takeaways from him. Um, uh, he makes uh, the, the point that most black slaves were Muslim before they were brought here. Um, and, and I didn't really look that up or what's up, but I didn't know that. And I think when we were talking before, you're like, I don't know, but that's a, a great part of history we don't right. necessarily know. Right. Um, he said that MLK was more revolutionary in his last three years um, and was getting more towards the non-peaceful things, which I just... I. I don't know. I never thought that about MLK. Um, and then um, and then he is pretty hardcore about one of reparations in terms of land grants and no taxation for African Americans going forward. So I guess those were kind of some of my takeaways from that. You guys want to expand? Yeah, he was also another person that I was kind of kind of uh, iffy on. Like, uh, because, yeah, a lot of people don't know that there is a difference between the Nation of Islam and actual Islam. Right. Um, the Nation of Islam was a, was a black identity sort of movement that came about uh, with our displeasure with Christianity uh, that took root in certain urban areas. And they tailored Islam to kind of meet the needs of black people in that moment. Um, the problem with any sort of like religious movement that comes about is that you run into this cult of personality. So... Elijah Muhammad took on the role of Muhammad, uh, the prophet, you know, more or less. He was seen as the last prophet uh, by the Nation of Islam, and it created this whole culture. And it's one of the reasons that Malcolm X eventually did move away from the Nation of Islam, because when he did go to Mecca on his Hajj, he realized how different the iterations of Islam yeah. actually was. Uh, but yeah, uh, as far as MLK is concerned, and the Nation of Islam is largely known for being radical. Uh, in the black community, not, like not a lot of us um, who are raised outside of that identify with it in any, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like with MLK, a lot of people will act like I have a dream is where MLK's life kind of ended. You know, as far as that's the height of his story, and he died afterwards. The kind of three years after that, you know, nobody really talks about is because he pissed off a lot of people in those last <laughs> couple of years. Um, yeah, MLK started talking about Vietnam. He started talking about economic policies. He started holding the U.S. government accountable on an international right. level. And, yeah, you start <laughs> you start messing with the power at that point in time, and you stop making friends. And, yeah, that, that whole story about that is super, is super interesting. So I would encourage people to take a look at it. But, you know, that last speech that he gave, you know, about him, you know, seeing the mountaintop was really just an understanding of, he was so close to death at that moment because the realization was is that he had pissed off the wrong people and he knew it. Um, 
but he was way more radical in his ideas in those last three years because he had started to move away from the um, you know from a lot of the other people in the movement the NAACP had actually distanced themselves from him hmm. so, yeah he did get a, lo- a lot more radical wow wow well, yeah, I, I knew nothing about that. So you know, <laughs> you know, just sitting here soaking it in. So then uh, next we had Dr. Uh, Alfie Breland Noble. She's a psychologist um, with or specializing in uh, like mood disorders and what so. And I think um, a couple takeaways that I take from her is that African Americans avoid treatment. Uh, and they don't feel like a lot of the doctors and what they'll understand. And, and it would be difficult to understand if you didn't live through things. And then she also talked about microaggressions and also the effect on people if you had that happen to you 10 times a week or even a day versus somebody that only has it like once a day. It's like going to significantly change like your mood and how you feel. And yeah. Yeah, people being able to relate to you. Yeah. Yeah. No, um that that largely is like identity politics when it comes to the experience of anybody other than America, right? Especially when you're talking about it on a racial basis, is that you receive this sort of feedback from all the things around you and it does kind of cultivate the way that you see yourself and the way that you interact with the world. Right. Um so you know, I I often think about it like a like an aggressive dog, right, or a rescue. Um, that dog who has seen some sort of trauma in its life, maybe it was beat by an old owner or something like that. You know, don't be surprised that you have to have to you have to do some like socialization work to get that dog out of that space because it was trained that that was the way that it had to respond to stimuli. Yeah. Right. And it's the same thing with people. You know, if if a person has been physically abused or mentally abused, it 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 impacts the way that they interact with the remainder of the world. So if there's some trauma there, then you know it's it's justified. And I think what's not understood, and or I would say is is not sympathized with, and America does have a bit of an empathy problem, uh, largely, is that that is the way that the black that black people tend to see ourselves. Um, you know, I, I say I was I was raised to understand when the police officers pull you over, keep your hands at ten and two. They said that in the book too. Yeah, you know, announce any movements, um, you know, and, and ask for permission for everything, you know, um, which governs the way that I interact with law enforcement. Right. Right. I don't know how many of my white counterparts receive that same sort of, you know. So, it, it, plus you think about even if. Even I, if I didn't experience lynchings or anything like that, those are the stories that are passed out. Right, it can happen. Right, so you you grow this fear of things because these are all the things that have happened, and you know they have happened because you've interacted with people that has happened too. So even now in the twentieth and twenty first century, it's like this stuff still is relevant to us because it's traumas that are carried forward. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, it, it's interesting. You know, when we talk about, like, the the effects of living in a certain sort of society, it's the same experience for LGBTQ people. You right. know, they've existed as long as humans have existed, in all honesty. But they had, people act like the LGBTQ movement is a new thing. Like, it just popped up. But people have been working for it for years. Same thing with women. You know, laws of coverture um, existed in the Victorian era. Women didn't get the right to vote until 1920. You know, and it was like, were women just not a not a thing up until that point? Right. No, it's, they were there, but... I mean, Roman women were allowed to own property and had power and what so. It's like, I think we regressed, which was probably uh, mainly Christianity's fault in the West, you know? Right, uh, yeah. right. So again, you know, when it comes to, like, the way that women see themselves, the way that anybody sees themselves, there's a historical context that people carry forth with them that we're not always aware of. Right, and microaggressions, I... I, again, was kind of one of the main things I took away, and I guess just to give a couple examples that they that they gave in there, just so if you don't understand like I didn't, um, like when we were talking about um, Dr. Alfie, she said like one of the things is like when you go to the grocery store and the cashier gives the white lady her card back, but then sets it on the table because she doesn't want to touch you. Right. Or like when people, because you've got different hair, ask you a bunch of crap about it or to touch it or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, 
you know, I, I can't remember who it was. It was saying that she had a wrap around her hair because she just didn't want to fix it. Right. And then, of course, everybody just thought it was cultural and just wouldn't leave it alone. And she's like, they didn't ask so-and-so about his stupid baseball cap. You know, why do I have to put up with all this? Right. You know, right. so... Um, so just, I mean, they think it's like little things, and you might think it's just a little thing, and if it only happened to you once every week or once a month, it's not a big deal, but if you put yourself in somebody else's shoes where it's like multiple times a day, right. it's way more... It's on a regular basis. Aggravating, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Eric Adams, uh, so he was 22 years a New York policeman and then became a politician leader. Um, he was severely beaten at 15, which made him want to become a cop and change things. Um, you know, I think he, he, one of the main takeaways I take from him is that officers need to be uh, trained and empowered to be able to report each other or to not let bad things happen. Uh, that they need to be like almost like elected and organized based on the communities. Um, and that... Blue Lives Matter mocks Black Lives Matter just because of how it is, even though you could have a campaign, but why name it right. the same thing? Right. So, again, I'm not trying to call it out. I'm just trying to bring out some things that just kind of raise my eyebrows that I thought were interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. You guys add anything onto there? He no. seemed like an upstanding guy. Yeah, I think he's actually currently running for mayor in New York. Is he? Yeah, I think it's him and Andrew Yang are like two of the big names there. It just he seems to me like he's a he's a very dynamic person. Like he got diagnosed with diabetes and in less than a year he like converted to being a vegan and reversed it. Like yeah. boom. You know, yeah. like hey, there's a problem, I'll fix it. Yeah. You know, and that's pretty drastic. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, and he was a policeman, so he got to right. see that side of it and to see how the police work because the police is a different culture. Yeah, I'm sure in different cities it's different too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but no, I mean, I, I, I like the fact that we got a chance to hear from somebody who's been on the inside of law enforcement to talk intelligently about law enforcement. Yeah. You know, that way, you know, you know it comes from a reputable source, right? Mm -hmm. um, the idea, the relationship that people have with law enforcement currently is a very tenuous one. Um, so to have that sort of qualified source, I think was a great perspective to get. Right. You know, one of the things that we didn't mention, but I thought if you kind of put them together, um, it would work really well. But it was, uh, let me see if I can find where I had written it down here. Oh, it was Ebony Williams. Changed the law to being one of deadly force coming from a reasonable fear to an articulable specific necessity. And so if you did that and you empowered the police to like report against each other and not stand for that behavior and try to get their buddy not to do it to get in trouble in the first place, like you put those two things together, I bet that would change the entire policing community. Just those two things if yeah. you could get it to happen. You know? I think um, police have a have a police have a marketing issue right, <laughs> right now in American society. Um, oh, they can't do anything wrong right now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really big issue because, um, you know, there was this guy who does police trainings, and one of the, his philosophy is something that he called killology. Um, and it, it really says that in order to be an effective police officer, you have to be prepared to kill. And that is a really, really destructive sort of ideology to put in place. Right, because human beings are not made that way. Right. Yeah. Now, to be fair, unless you're a killer. <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> policing is a difficult like yeah. is a difficult field to be in because you do have to make judgment calls at the drop of a dime that can be life or death. Yeah. So to understand that somebody may kill preemptively to save them, their own lives is not an issue in my mind. Right. You made the necessary call for yourself at that moment, but how you get to the point where you need to make that decision right. becomes a problem when they're telling you to make that decision before anything else happens. I agree with you, because I, I was military, and like if you go in for the right reasons, in my opinion, then you accept two things. One of them overtly that everybody knows about the military, that you're signing up and you may die for your country, right. and, with, and the things that you believe in. But really... You know, one of the things that I think I learned there, and maybe some of the books that I read doing military history, is um, is that most people that give their lives up willingly are a hero, and so they don't do it for their country. They don't do it for the people back home. 
they do it for the person right beside them, yeah. you know, to like try to save their life or whatever the case. And so, but interestingly, those are I think two like very high admirable things. Great, yeah. And so, in the military, I think that's just how it is. And so, it is interesting to me coming from that culture to like learning that police aren't that way. And so if they really were there to serve and protect, then every one of them should know and accept that they may die in the service of the community and it shouldn't be their number one thing to protect their life, right. you know? Right. Um, and that's, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me, but I mean, just even the other day when, I, again, I apologize, I don't remember the names, but that, that one female police officer that shot that guy that thought she, that she was tasing him. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, you know, of course, everybody can question not being in the seat. But I would think that with your strong arm, you would have your non-lethal. And with your weak hand, you would have your lethal one. So if you were to, in the split of the moment, not know which one you're grabbing, you would grab the non-lethal. Right. But instead, they do the opposite because it is more important for them to protect their own life. So if they do get confused, then in the mistake, they at least have the lethal, which to me makes absolutely no th sense like I feel like the non-lethal should be on your strong side so that you default to that but I think it comes back to what you're saying is that's not how the culture of police right, right. Is, is at all and I know? think and I think the culture of police also becomes a problem when we can't hold people accountable good people make bad decisions sure you know, so uh, even in speaking of that one I think when they showed the police footage of the, of the woman who shot him she was like I shot him and it sounded like she was kind of shocked at what happened, right? right. Um, so I think if a police officer makes makes the wrong call on something, that's understandable. It happens. They had to make that judgment call, and sometimes you don't get it right. Right. You know, but, but it's still negligence, and there's accountability. Exactly. There Maybe not murder, but you should be in trouble, right. and probably not a police officer anymore. Yeah. So there, there should be accountability, and there should be a system set in place that allows this to not become so pervasive. To where it's like, oh, I made a mistake. I'm not going to be held accountable to it. So you can make a mistake and not be held accountable to it either. Right. You know, it's like CEOs getting on boards to raise their compensation. <laughs> <laughs> together. Right. Let's build a system where right. we win. Exactly. And it's tough yeah. for, because how many times in a policeman's career are they going to be put in a particular situation? You know, Who knows? Um, over a 20 year career, but. Maybe two or three times. times. Yeah, that's, times my, right. that's my point. But all you need is one for it yeah. to be a lethal situation. Absolutely. But, and I get that. But the training is so difficult because you could train, but it's not really a lethal situation. And then you may only Except for on cops, you have that really one chubby guy that's like way behind <laughs> the other guys. Just <laughs> that guy's not going to get up there he's, to make that bad decision. For, for a reason. Yeah, so. <laughs> you know, I think society needs cops. I think you know they deserve the respect. Uh, they've sure. earned that much from all of us. Right. Um, but you are a civil servant. You're there to serve your community. Well, that's right. So Should be a servant. But yeah, I think like what we talked about though, that's not like the legality right. of it. Right. You know? Right. They're law enforcement, not community servants. And maybe that's another that maybe that could that, that third thing to the list, like to just totally change what a police officer is. Right. Um, okay. Then Erica Alexander, she's an actor, entrepreneur. Um, one of the things she talked about, she actually really took it to, to James in terms of him being a, um, a, um, angel investor and not investing in any, uh, black female entrepreneurs and that she brought up the statistic that only 0.2% uh, of all investment goes, uh, to black females. And then, um, I think, um, the main quote that I got from her, um, that, it, it rubbed me wrong, but I get it. She's mad, and she's pushing it. But she said, all whites are guilty in participating in systematic racism. Um, and so I guess if she meant that in the fact that the system is inherently that way and that not everybody is standing up to stop it, I get it. But still, I mean, I still feel like we're in stuff together. And, like, going after people and saying things like that makes them really feel us versus them, you know? Yeah. But I, I think when I hear that, what I, what I think is a discussion of what allyship really looks like, right? Because for the, for the aggrieved party, um, it's a much more visceral experience. There's much more on the line 
So that sort of regression just kind of comes about in that sort of a way. Whether or not it's justifiable, you know, that's that's relative to the person, right? Um, but it's the luxury of the ally to be able to decide when they choose to be an ally. So at any point in time, somebody with privilege can say, I did my part, I'm tired of helping, I want to sit this one out. Right. <laughs> you know? I'm not doing this forever. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, uh, again... You know, her whole thing when she says that is like you're you're guilty is not guilty by encouragement, is guilty you by didn't create inaction. this. Right. You're not necessarily actively perpetuating it, right. but you're not helping me stop it. Exactly. It's an action or passivity. Lines. Right. Yeah. So right. Yeah. It, and at, at right now, I mean when we have a lot going on in these elections, you know, I see it, you know. I mean it's tough right now to to, to sit on the sidelines and, and not do it and kind of, you are perpetuating it. Right. And and I you know I, I can't speak to James, but it is you you think it would be useful to try to go out there and make an effort to spread the money um, amongst minorities. But it's his job too, in his mind, to protect it and grow his money. So he's looking for the best ideas, and his network might not be opening that up for him. You know, and so I'm only using him as an example. I mean, you know that, who you know, right? Right. And, and like, if he's not trying to push it farther, and I'm sure. At a certain degree, he's like, I'm giving people opportunity and money. It's their responsibility to find me and dance the dance that I like to get my money. And not to say that that's, that that's right, but I can see, I bet most VC and angel investors, venture capitalists, angel investors, super rich people, <laughs> that's what we're talking about, probably think that way. Yeah, um, but I think it also, you know, all of us owe it a little bit to open up a little more to just our no, small local groups. So I'm not defending speak, them. You know, you know yeah. a lot of I'm people not, talk about reparations inside of here. And, I mean, I, that, I think, would be almost impossible in our society with how people believe today, the majority of people. But it did, I liked listening to it and, like, understanding. Because I think I've talked to you about this before. Um, I was one of the people until the last nine years that was I don't didn't want to believe that our country's racist and I don't know anybody like that personally and like I've tried to be like good myself and like realize that I have biases and try to overcome them etc um, and then the whole Trump administration and all the ugliness and divisiveness that has come from that I'm just like it's real it's overt now it's like not even like underneath it's like incontrovertible and now the more that I've like opened up to engage and listen and read things like this um, you know I don't I you know I, I think it would be very difficult to do like what they're talking about land grants because you'd have to take land away from people to get to other people yeah. and that is inherently un-American but you know maybe we could do things like African Americans are like like SBA loans or veterans like you get half the interest rate or no money down to start businesses and maybe tax breaks and credits and yeah. like that would be unacceptable because we do that for veterans we do that for you know we've done things for Native Americans right like so like to me um, I have to say it's driven it forward with me and even some of these uncomfortable things why are you uncomfortable right because that's, you have to know at some point you know at some point that you feel vulnerable about it right or something right, right? yeah and, you know? and honestly Phil I want to I want to say thank you for that because that that's that's a big thing to ask yourself why are why am I uncomfortable with this because not all of these conversations want to sit well with you immediately and just the fact that somebody is willing to take that point means you're willing to to delve with it a little bit further and I think that's that's how we start to hey Clover, <laughs> that's how we start to deal with the empathy issue, right? Right. Um, but I, I will say, you know, when it <laughs> when it comes to the idea of reparations, it's 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 impossible in my mind at this point right. in time because there's no way to quantify the impact, you know, of of the dollars lost yeah. over the years, right? And to be able to try and create some sense of equity in that moment, there would be a huge negative blowback in my life. I agree. You know, and... But we could give people opportunity. Uh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, that is the American way, is like, teach a man to fish, and, you know, type thing, not a hand out, a hand up. Right. And people wouldn't necessarily, even though they probably should, have to admit wrongdoing to try to just say the statistics are like this and it's not right, even if I'm not going to go and say it's about slavery. Right. But I could still try to make the future better. And I think some people 
even though that may not be right, I think a lot of people could walk that far. You know what I mean? Right. And also, don't don't take me saying that, you know, there would be a huge blowback as justification to not do it. You know, if there's a way to implement it and make it equitable and make it happen, I think it's it's a discussion that can be had. And it could possibly happen. I mean, you get the millennials in charge and stuff. They're a whole lot different than the baby boomers. Right. But, but know, there's things so. that can be done in a broad way that help a much higher percentage of the black community, like health care, right? I mean, the ones that would benefit the most, uh, not most, but as a percent, there's just things like that that you could do or to make Universal college sure. education mm-hmm. free. So right. you're not, it's, it's a combination, right? It's not overt. And, you know, so it... I'm sure we'll get some more bad comments about uh, us being like crazy liberal now. You got to bring it up on there. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I want it for myself. With, you know, yeah. well, college. So two perfect examples, right? You look at the Native American population, or indigenous Americans, rather, and you look at the Japanese Americans after World War II, right? right? So um, we came, you know, the Europeans came, they stole the indigenous people's land, and eventually they gave them reservations and they gave them sovereignty as a nation and now they have you know bargaining rights on their own as independent nations right. they have some sense of agency reclaimed um, you have the internment of Japanese Americans in the 1940s right and um, basically they were they were removed from the from the western coast put on these and in, put in these internment camps had right. their property and businesses and everything stolen from yeah, them right. with no legal yeah. recourse provided back um, and then it wasn't until a couple years ago that we issued a national apology and, and, and gave them something to reclaim some agency. And I think that's really what reparations comes down to, is some sort of reclamation of agency, right. you know, for, for the aggrieved parties. So I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. It, is, it is kind of uh, ironic because, uh, like, the United States is, like, hardcore on, like, the stuff that Germany did to you know the Jewish community and the rest of Europe, and we've been very hardcore about what the Japanese did to the Chinese and the Koreans, right? And then absolutely no accountability for, what for slavery right. and mm-hmm. the things that we've done or that we were not proud right. of either. Um, so our last person, David Banner, American rapper and actor uh, from Mississippi, um, you know. I'd say he was the most outspoken uh, in terms of like really hardcore. Uh, I think it, it, like summary, obviously, he's a lot more of a basically like white Caucasian civilization is bad, um, and there's nothing you can do to save it. Why are we even trying? You know, the, what we should have done is is it, the problem is not white racism; it's it's the absence of it yeah. in African Americans. Yeah. Um, and. Um, I just, I just, I, I, I refuse to believe things like that because it's almost like an admittance that like things can't get better and we can't reconcile and be a human race yeah. instead of like uh, just have little uh, differences. And obviously the differences that we have culturally and stuff, but you know the cosmetic ones are ridiculous. Right. So yeah, that there were certain aspects in all of these interviews where the people who took more radical stances it becomes very jarring to listen to, Um, even as an African-American. It's not like I haven't maybe at some point in time in my life also felt that too, but it's it's up to each of us individually to reconcile that, you know. Um, But what I I will say is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Right. So when we talk about, that's Newton's third law, and for everything that happens to individual communities, people, you, you have to gauge their response off of the traumas that they experienced, right? So when you ask why like radical movements end up coming about, that's because the impact of the events that they've experienced and the symbolism that has taken on has created this boogeyman. And they don't know how to respond to it in any way outside of anger at everything that it represents or everything that embodies it. It's not constructive, but it's, it's cathartic, <laughs> you know? And you know, that's also the problem, it's not constructive. It just makes them feel some sort of some you know, a little bit better, but it doesn't mend the fences. It doesn't bring people together. It doesn't progress right. anything. So it's kind of like the the old saying: "An eye for an eye will leave everyone, everyone blind, blind. Yep. except for one person with one eye." <laughs> <laughs> the winner, right. and he has the last one. Right, the one who tells the tale. <laughs> <laughs> it, it 
it's just it's not workable. So you, you hope you hope it doesn't come to that. But you know. right, you know, I think. I mean, we this already went way longer than than we wanted, but I I feel like it was a great discussion. Uh, I think there are a lot of great people on here, and we appreciate them doing the interviews. And thank you, AC and Tony. Yeah, you know, you were listening right. most of the time. I was listening. Well, they, we could the dogs another, are tired of us talking. <laughs> another half an hour. I spoke too long, right, so. Clover felt like she wasn't getting enough love. Oreo was right. taking up all the love. But I do think it's a worthwhile to to read it. You know, the one thing I noticed from the reviews it was like one or two stars or five. Right. And I think that these type of things don't necessarily persuade people. Confirmation people. bias, baby. People they just want to read about what they already believe in. Or okay. what, they, what they've already heard and what they already know, unfortunately, you know? Right. Yeah. So. But no, I think these are valuable discussions. And again, you know, thanks to you guys for having this discussion, for w being willing to participate in something like this. Because I know there were points in times where you guys were probably stepping outside of your comfort zone. So, <laughs> you know. But you gotta do it. You gotta read things you don't agree with. I would probably do lean more liberal, but I still read a lot of the conservative stuff. Right. Um, and you know, I, I think the more information you could take in, I mean, I love that, that meme, uh, uh, like the dude's head exploding and it says, you mean I could take in new information or listen to an opposing view and change my mind? <laughs> right. Mind blown. Right. Yes, you can. We would all be better people. And the nation would be better. better. I think that's yeah. that's the greatest way that this democratic experiment continues to progress forward, is the fact that we have uncomfortable conversations, the fact that we are not afraid to talk about things that we may have messed up on at some point right. in time. You know, because nobody's infallible, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You know, it's okay to claim your mistakes. And if people can't get better... You know, people say in jokes all the time they love some zombie shells, but, you know, if we can't communicate and find compromises and fix things, then we probably will destroy ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, need more love and less hate, right? Like the dogs. Yeah. Like right. the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, join us next week. we will be Tony going over proposed tax legislation, Secure Act 2.0. So hopefully there's some, some good things in there. Uh, and then two weeks after that, because generally we'll take the last uh, week of the month off, I'm going to do another financial subject on Roth conversions, you know, how, when, and why to do them. And then June 11th uh, is going to be another live broadcast uh, with um, Jante Mufti with Firefly. So thanks so much. If you watched the whole thing, we love you. Good job. Read the book with us. Hopefully you did. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. See you guys. Bye.